Okay, the first thing uh, I want to talk about is turn your Bibles to Daniel 11. Now, I'm, we're going to have a look at um, what happens in the last part of the last seven years of history. It's actually inside the last three years and seven months. Now, people say, why do you explain that? Is because in, um, Jesus told us a fact. In Luke 16, he says, if they do not believe Moses, who wrote Genesis, we're talking here now of at least atheists and agnostics, right? And the prophets, they do not believe Moses or the prophets. They don't believe that somebody can predict the future. He tells us they will not believe one rose from the dead. God reveals himself to the world through prophecy. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 40. Keep your finger in that Daniel 11 one. Turn your Bibles to, uh, to uh, Isaiah. Uh, sorry, not Isaiah. Where are we going? Isaiah 46, yep. 46, 5 to 10. When you teach creation, right, to people, you provide the arguments you undermine their foundation. See, they think they've got the educated, the scientific view, and you just have to say to them, there's no such thing as life without DNA. And the only, and DNA only comes from the results of RNA. And the only thing that produces RNA is a living organism with DNA. How do you break that cycle? And that's what evolutionists believe. They believe there was life without DNA, right? And there's no possible way. And you say, this is real science, right? This is real science. This is not uh, lightning struck a pool of water and somehow life came into being, right? You've got to undermine that. You've got to realize that they have a belief system. It's not empirical. What I just said, was the same yesterday, it's the same today, and it'll be the same tomorrow. <coughs> All life has DNA, and DNA is only produced by RNA, and, uh, and the only RNA you get comes from it, life with DNA, okay? But that doesn't prove the God of the Bible. It proves there was a creator. There are people in the um, intelligent design uh, guys who are not Christian, right? Because they, they haven't encountered Jesus Christ, but they see that the problems of believing that life came together by chance is just not true, right? They, they can't, they, they just can't see it in their scientific endeavor, okay? But they believe it was created, but they hold it, who created? Was it a God? Was it a God of the Bible? Was it aliens designing life? But all you've done is put the creation of life to a laboratory that no one will ever be able to see. You're just hiding it, right? But when you show prophecy, prophecy stamps, this is the God who created us. Right, this is what distinguishes him from the false gods. And here's the challenge he gave to the whole world at the time of Isaiah. And we read from verse uh, Isaiah 46. Uh, we'll start at 5 to... Hang on, is that right? Isaiah 46. Five to, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, 5 to 10. Okay. And it says here, he begins by mocking 
mocking all concepts that man had created of God, right? He says, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? They, the unbeliever, lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes it a god. That's how the pagan gods were made. They were made by man. They prostrate themselves, yes, they worship. They bear it on their shoulder, they carry it, because it can't move itself. And set it in its place and it stands. <laughs> From its place it shall not move. God is mocking. Right? Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. Remember this and show yourselves men. Now this is really important in scripture. God refers to men as men or beasts. He calls the women, women who just think that life is about drinking. He says the cows of Bashan who say to their husbands, Go and get me some wine. But that's how they see life. Right? I'm not a teetotaler, but uh, there is excess drinking in churches, right, without doubt. There is no, there's just <coughs> indulgence. Indulgence. The early Christians did what they had to do raising their kids, and they gave for the cause of Christ. Today, many Christians just use their wealth for themselves, right? It's up to you to use your money, right? You don't give it all to a church. <coughs> you are responsible for your money and you'll be accountable when you did it. How you were a steward, what did you do for it, right? Okay, and now it says here, remember this and show yourselves men. Men created in the image of God, the highest form of life with reason. He says, remember the, and recall to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And now he'll tell you the, the, what you are to put to test. He says, declaring the end of the, sorry, the end from the beginning. Okay? Declaring the end from the beginning. And then he says, um, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Right? That's what distinguishes God from the pagan world. He always addresses every erroneous thought. Turn to Acts chapter 1 for a second. Not Acts 1. Um, Romans 1. I just got to find it. Okay. We'll go to verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Professing to be wise. Now, they're talking about wise men. And the term homo sapien means wise men. When they got into this thing of evolution, Professing to themselves uh, to be wise, they became fools. The Bible says, a fool says in his heart there is no God. And then it goes on to tell you what they did with this understanding. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And that's what they've done. They tell us that our ancestors were apes and be, or similar uh, 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 creatures to apes 
and then before that there were frogs and things like this. I loved the video put out by the Australian uh, uh, Creation in his, uh, Ministry. <laughs> it was called From a Frog to a Prince, right? The Theory of Evolution. And I was at work one day and got a guy, he's a science degree, and uh, he says, don't you believe evolution? I said, I don't believe that, that frogs turn into princes. And he said, the, ev the evolution does, it doesn't teach that. I said, oh, yes, it does. It says that the highest form on this earth at one stage in history past was a frog, an amphibian. And today we've got Bonnie Prince Charles, right? And that's where, he, that's where the lineage comes from, OK? You do it. And he laughed and he said, I guess it does. And it does. That's what it teaches. And it says here, they say that our, we've come from creatures. That's who our creators were. That's the source of our being. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonour their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving uh, in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. In the 40s, right, we had a paradigm shift in how we view life. The United Nations brought in a system to teach evolution all over the world. The paradigm before was the Bible on which our laws and values happen. This is where the rot began. So in the 50s, we had a period called the Golden Age of Hollywood where they made movies that showed men in difficult situation doing honourable things, how they handled it. And then they started to glorify in the 50s um, wild guys, you know, like Marlon Brando, James Dean, they were the heroes. The 60s brought in full frontal nudity, right, in movies, right? They sh there was a movie which they made a series out called MASH. The word scoundrel is a man that uh, cheats on his wife or chases other men's wives, right? That's what a scoundrel was, right? And we had a series called MASH. And if you ever watch that movie as a Christian, the heroes are chasing women who are in South Korea who are married to people back in the States. They're doing their term and they're the heroes, right? It's so subtle what is happening. And then the end of the 60s, the uh, promiscuity became the main, um, the main push, right? And the whole Christian value on the sacredness of marriage is gone. And what we see now is this homosexual issue and all this. It couldn't be done until they replaced the foundation. When Christian uh, politicians write, now, when, when they say this is a Christian nation, it's not. We haven't been a Christian nation since we began Baal worship in and worshipping Moloch in the late 60s when we had legal, legal abortion. He, forget about the argument before, I don't want to get involved in it, but from now, from the late 60s, we are not a Christian nation. We are a pagan nation uh, with child sacrifice legal in Australia, right? And we've got to understand that. Now, go back. Go back to... Um, Daniel. So now we're going to look at the last part of the last three years of the last seven of the second half, the last part of the second half of uh, the last seven years of history. Okay? So we look at, we go back to Daniel, and he says, This is what's going to happen. At the time of the end, 
The king of the, of the south shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen and everything. But I want to get to the last bit. He says, but news... Oh, okay, I've got to read the verse before. Uh, he's, in verse 42. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. In this last period of time, Egypt's destruction is spelt out so we know it's a fact at this period of history, right? We know that is a fact. And then he says, and the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and north shall trouble him, the him, the he, it's the Antichrist. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. This is the Antichrist. Okay? So we've got three groups of people that I want to discuss. There's the he, which is Antichrist. We've got the north, and we've got the east. Okay? Now, we're told from the halfway mark, Jesus said, it'll be kingdom against nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. These kingdoms we're about to see have never been brought together for this confrontation. And it's, we're seeing the beginning of it now. Now, understand this. I don't, as Searle said down in Gladstone, he said, you've got to get away from newspaper um, hermeneutics, right? Newspenter, a newspaper theology. What's happening in the Ukraine, right, what is happening over there is a picture of the future, but none of us here know if it is going to just roll on completely or there is a caveat, a period of stop between it. Right? In 1993, the Oslo Accord was signed in Oslo to bring about two states in um, Israel. And they were to do it by 1998. It just didn't come about. But if you were a newspaper theology boy and you trusted the press for things and you're a Christian who doesn't stick totally to the Bible, just is influenced by this, you're going to write and say things that are not going to happen. In Y2K, the secular government, the secular papers, everything, said we were going to have a financial crash in the year 2000. Right? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there is going to be a crash that's going to affect the rich in James chapter 5. But the Bible continually says it's in the wrath of God. And none of us who are following Christ are going to be there. Right? It's not going to affect it. Even in James it says, you have been fattened up for the day of slaughter. Zephaniah chapter 1 says your gold and your silver uses the same words. will go to nothing. But Christians got caught up with it and took the secular and the conspiratorial things. Right, there are things that are true on the, in, um, on the net on conspiratorial, but there's also nuttiness in there. And it's hit and miss. If you stick to the Bible, you won't be embarrassed. How many saw Chuck Missler when he came up here? Right, fantastic. I love Chuck Missler. But he said Y2K was going to bring in the, um, uh, the uh, uh, money crash. He said he went away from what the Bible said to newspaper theology. Okay. So we'll deal with the north. Okay. We have to, we know it's in at the time of the end. The time of the end is the last three and a half years. If you go back to Daniel 11, 31, it gives you a time frame. He says there that 31, 32, they'll set up the abomination of desolation. We know exactly when that's going to be because Daniel 11, 30, uh, 11, ah, Daniel 12, 11 says from the time he sets up the abomination of desolation, 
it's, uh, there's 1,290 days, three and a half years plus one month, three years and seven months, okay? The time frames that God uses are three and a half years, but he doesn't, it doesn't have to automatically start at the beginning and the end. It's just a time frame of three and a half years, okay? And we're told that it starts a month earlier. Then we see at the time the end's the same, and at that time, what time? In 12.1, Michael the Archangel stands up, right? And uh, then at the end, it's, it's all about the last three and a half years, right? And that is repeated in Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21 and Mark 13. So we're going to search the Bible to find out who this enemy is. And the enemy has to be uh, from the north, and also, it has to be in that last little section, right? This last little section. So let's turn to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog. Now, in Gog and Magog, it says here that it's in the latter days and the latter years, okay? Now, we can't take that as it. We cannot take that as it. You know why? Because in uh, Deuteronomy 4.26, I call heaven and earth together against, to witness against you to this day, that you will quickly perish from the land that you're crossing over the Jordan to go in. And it says, when you are in distress in the latter days, ask anyone, there's another distress coming, but ask anyone today, when is the biggest distress the Jews have ever had? That was 39 to 45. He said, I will remember my covenant with your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's for the land. And less than two, uh, two years later, the world voted the Jews could have the land, and three years later, they're in there. Okay? Right? But it said that was the latter days, or the latter years. I'm not sure which one. They're interchangeable. Right? So we can't just say, oh, it says here in the story of Gog and Magog that it's the latter days, because what's that? 45, that's 55, that's over 75 years ago, right? 75 years ago in that period of time. It has to be in this last three and a half years. So let's go through with a fine tooth comb in uh, Ezekiel and we'll find here in verse um, okay now we'll, first of all we'll go down to um, I just got to find this hold on okay okay it says here, you come from the remotest parts of the north. If you get a, I'm just identifying this, it's called Gog is the leader and he comes from the land of Magog. The land of Magog is where he lives. Now, in the Bible, you get a guy like, his name is Judah. Then Judah becomes a tribe. Judah then becomes a region in Israel. The term Judah, it progresses, and then it becomes a country when the kingdom is divided. Okay, it's an actually a, a nation. Same with Magog. You have Magog is was a person, right? A descendant of Japheth, and we know that he lived. Uh, his descendants moved uh, up and around the Black Sea. 700 years before Jesus walked this earth, Hesiod, the most famous Greek poet of his time, said that Magog, he studied the genealogies of all the different countries. He said, we, he said he lived around the Black Sea, him and his descendants, okay? Josephus and Philo said the same thing, right? That's where they come from. Now, there's other arguments whether they're Scythians or not, but it doesn't matter. They lived around the Black Sea. You're talking southern Russia, right? Full stop. 
Now, here, we go back here and we'll see about the time of this war. Okay? And it will come to pass, verse 18, at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. My fury and my fate are shown in my face, and my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath. The time frame is the wrath of God. Uh, I have spoken. Surely in that day there should be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. When Christ returns to the earth, he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. Bingo. There's a massive earthquake. Gigantic. Revelation 16. 17 to the end of the chapter says there's an earthquake uh, greater than any other earthquake that's ever happened in history. Right? And he says, Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the birds of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. At his presence, he's come. Okay, The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. It's a replay of Jericho. right? If you go and see the story, compare the revelations with the story of going and conquering Jericho. It's the same. Okay, And that everything falls to the ground. I'll call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I'll bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, uh, flooding, ra uh, sorry, so flood flooding rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. They're the promised judgments of the wrath of God already established. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I'll be known in the eyes of many nations then they shall know that I am the Lord. The conversion of those survivors of Armageddon, right, if you want to know that, it's uh, Zechariah 12, 9 to the end of the chapter or that's the Jews' conversion and what we have, Zechariah uh, 16, sorry, there's no Zechariah 16, Zechariah 14, 16 to verse 20. That's the Gentile conversion at the same period of history at the time of Armageddon, right? Armageddon is not an independent war. It is just the last battle, right, where the conversion happens. And then if you keep on going down, it says here, uh, there's a verse there, you can search it yourself. It turns, oh, okay, here we have the other one. There is the, uh, what do you call it, the um, description covering everything of a nuclear war. And if you search it, every one of them, they're all in a period called the day of the Lord, which is the period of God's wrath. And here's one of them. If you were to be in, uh, if the uh, atomic bomb went off in Rockhampton, it won't. They're not going to waste it to get you guys. <laughs> They're going to waste it to get somebody else, right? Okay. If atomic bomb went off, you've got to clean up the bodies. And these are the things you've got to do. The first thing you've got to do, everyone's got to get involved because it's really serious. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to pick one burial ground. One burial ground. You don't pollute the whole place. Everyone's radioactive, right, who's been killed. Right? Some have evaporated, there's nothing left, but the others who have died, you've got to pick them up and bury them. So you give them one. And you give it downwind. Right? What are the prevailing winds? Right? If the prevailing winds are coming from the south, you don't put it in the south because it's going to come across you guys. Right? Then you can't just pick up a dead body and throw him into a hole because you have to wear special shoes, suits to pick up those people. Here's just one excerpt, one part of that nuclear war, and we see it. And every one of them are in the last three and a half years, if you go and see them. Got, it's got everything. It covers every part, aspect of that nuclear war. And it says here, let's look at it, 11. It will come to pass in that day that I'll give Gog a burial ground, a burial place there in Israel. A burial place, one. 
the valley of those who passed east of the sea, right? The prevailing winds came across from the east. And it says here, and it will obstruct travellers. That's the other point. It becomes a no-go zone. Okay? And then it says, therefore, they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, glorified, says the Lord. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party. So it's divided up, right? Search party and the barriers. Why doesn't the search guy pick it up? Because it's radioactive. You can't do it. And it says here, um, with the help of search party, pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they'll make a search. The search party will pass through the land and when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman God. And if there's another verse in there, and it says, this is the day that I have declared. It's talking about the day of the Lord. Right, this is the period of the wrath of God. The day of the Lord is the wrath of God. Okay, it is also the day that we are taken from this earth in the resurrection and rapture, right? That's why it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. Great if you're a believer, terrible if you're left behind. It's a holocaust, right? So that's your Ezekiel. That's Ezekiel. 38, and it's Gog and Magog. And Magog, as I said before, he was a man. His descendants, uh, some stayed there, some moved. If you've got Celt in you, you're, you're from Magog, right through Japheth. Magog went out and J, uh, Magog was the descendant of the Celts, right? He also might uh, have a brother too that is... A goma is similar. Then, as I said, it's the land of Magog. Where did he live, right? So we work this out. Now, if you go back to Ezekiel 38, if we go back to Ezekiel 38, it says here, Magog's not alone. Gog is not alone. He leads a confederacy. And here's the confederacy. Behold, I uh, will read, uh, read it, Son of Man, the, Ezekiel 38, verse 2. Son of Man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Uh, see, be care, uh, remember that, Meshach and Tubal. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, God Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, and prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and, um, and helmet, right? Now, uh, it says here, uh, sorry, helmet. Um, Goma, all its troops, the house of Togoma. Notice how it says the house of Togoma. From the far north and all its troops. Now, Togoma, the descendants of Togoma, uh, is an ancient uh, people group that were in Turkey. There were lots of different people groups. And they moved north and they did the Uzbekistans and the Tajikistans and the Kazakhstans with other people groups who intermarried, but that's who they were. Right? And um, so they've got these countries. Now he mentions them. It's uh, Iran, okay, it was Persia. And then it says uh, Libya. I think it does. Libya. <laughs> it definitely says, it, when it says um, Ethiopia, the Ethio the, when this was written 2,700 years ago, it was directed at the country of Sudan. They are the descendants of Kush. And, but the term Kush, as the um, uh, Kushites spread out, they took uh, Ethiopia. But it was directed at, to the people who were between the first and second cataract of the Nile River. It's to Sudan. Okay? 
and then it says Goma. Okay, Goma is with it. Now Goma is on the border of um, Turkey and uh, Armenia, and then the House of Togoma, which I told you all those Togoma people. Actually, the um, if you, if you don't know this, Xinjiang, which caused all the trouble in the Chinese Olympics from the Uyghurs who were threatening to boycott it, throw off a few bombs, their separatist group want to call themselves East Turkestan because they were Turkish people. Right over to, they spread right across uh, the north there into China, and they're dominant people in China, but they're dominated by the Chinese, okay? Now, we have to ask a question. We have to ask a question, is that list in the Bible uh, complete? Are there any other nations involved in this? Is that it? That's, that's just it with uh, Gog from the land of Magog, which is southern Russia, right? Is that it? Well, the Bible doesn't do that. It uses a few, and then you join it up with here, and you join it up with there. They're references. Turn to Ezekiel 32 while we're there. Now, this is really, really important that we can, we can explain this to non-Christians. They can see this, right? They can see it. Make it simple, and don't put any dates on it. You put a date on it, You've just made a fool of yourself because you will, cannot guess the date of that, right? You cannot say it's going to happen next year, the year after, or whatever, okay? But you can show it, and they can see it. This is right up to today's news. We are, the world is going into three kingdoms, right? You have the NATO people, you have Russia and its uh, allegiance with Iran and all its proxies, and we have China, the rise of China, okay? So here we have it here. It says, uh, where are we up to? Ezekiel 32, verse 15. When I make the land of Egypt desolate. When we go back to Daniel 11:40, he says, Egypt will not escape. That's when Egypt is destroyed. And that go the Bible goes into great detail about that. Isaiah 19. You look at it. I will strike Egypt and I will heal it. Right? And then he says at the end of that chapter, there'll be a highway. This is the millennium. From Egypt through to Assyria in Iraq. And he turns around and says, um, Blessed is Egypt, my people. When does God ever call Egypt, my people? Uh, Assyria, the work of my hands. And, Egypt, and Israel, my inheritance. Okay? That is the millennium, okay? Now we go back to here. This is when Egypt is destroyed. And it says here, um, when I make the land of Egypt desolate and the country is destitute of all that it once had, when I strike all who dwell in it, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Then they know. The purpose of wrath is to turn the stiff-necked people who will not accept Christ Right, God allows it to happen to bring about a change in them and a humility in them. Right, right at the moment, you can't reach them, uh, the average Muslim in these countries, because, because they've given their hearts, their, their heritage is Muslim, their um, families are Muslim, everyone. And what happens is in 1948, the Arabs all went to war with Israel. And they all said, Allah will give us victory! And they ran into war, and the mothers buried their sons. 56, a repeat. 67, a repeat. 1973, Yom Kippur, a repeat. After this one, the women say, who's this Allah character anyway? He is obviously subservient to the God of the Jews, right, because he can't beat them. And this is what turns them around, right? And it says they go on and it says uh, there are pillars throughout uh, Egypt to the God, to Yahweh, right throughout Egypt that, after this event. But now he's going to list the countries who are going to be with them. 
It says here, that was verse 15, Assyria is there and all her company, that's northwest Iraq, and they go down to the pit. There is Elam. Elam was the founder of what we know as Iran today and it had a middle period called Persia as it expanded. Elam started what we know as Iran today. Then it says, there is Meshach and Tubal. Remember Ezekiel 38 and 39? Meshach and Tubal. They can't get destroyed twice in two, to in two wars. There, the World War III is the battle for Jerusalem. That's where it starts. There's no battle before the seven years. That's, that's fairy tale stuff, right? There are, these are massive destructions in the day of the Lord. And when it says, in any war, where it turns around and says Israel, and Israel will never go into idolatry, that's it. You can't have them never going into idolatry here, a war seven years later or six years later, to judge them for their sin when they're not in indul uh, 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 idolatry anymore. Okay? So here we have there, Elam, then it goes on and says, um, there is Edom, that's the southern part of Jordan. Uh, the, uh, verse 20, they are the princes of the north, uh, all of them and the Sidonians, that's all uh, Lebanon. Okay, so is that comprehensive? No, there's a, another list. It's Psalm 83. <coughs> Psalm 83. Whoops. Psalm 83, verse 1. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult <coughs> and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, this is the fulfilment of Jihad. Okay, this is it. Right? The Russia is using the Arab world as pawns. And it says here, um, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Hezbollah, Hamas, PLO, and every other fruitcake group there, right? And other Arab nations. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom, the southern part of Jordan. The Ishmaelites, uh, descendants of Ishmael, who lived in the Arabian Peninsula. Moab, the middle of jo what is present-day Jordan. The Hagrites, Eonides' mother, Ishmael, Hagar, and gave a region named after its name in Arabia. Gebel, 40 kilometres north of Beirut. Ammon, the capital of Amman, the capital of Jordan in the northern part, and Amalek. Uh, Amalek were the first people group that fought um, uh, the Jews uh, and uh, from the Exodus. And there's an argument as to where they come from. It all depends where you believe Mount Sinai if you believe it's in the Sinai Peninsula, then it's there. But Galatians says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, right? And so the Amalekites were in the Arabian Peninsula. It all depends where they crossed the sea. Uh, Philistia, that's the Gaza. The inhabitants of Tyre, Lebanon again, southern Lebanon. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. The children of Lot are Ammon and Moab, and there became countries, Moab and Ammon, and their descendants are the ones who are claiming to be Palestinians. All those people claiming to Palestinians had uh, Jordanian passports before this, right? And Jordan has, is the final uh, place at, the, uh, at this stage, definitely, of, um, of uh, the descendants of Moab, okay? Now, Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the, and Yemen, 
they can see this jihad and they're not part of it. Go back to Ezekiel 38. And we see this today, the split between uh, the Iranian Shiite Muslims against the Sunnis in uh, Arabia where Mecca is and uh, the, what do you call it, the Iranians want to be the dominant group in the Muslim world. Now what did I say which verse it was? Uh, I just said what chapter? Oh, Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel. Okay. And look what Arabia says. These are on the Arabian Peninsula, these uh, cities. Okay. Okay. Th verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, on the day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages or go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without wars and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations. More than four million Jews have come back into the land of Israel since 1948 who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan are on the Arabian peninsulas, the merchants of March Tarshish. I don't know where Tarshish is. Um, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? They see it. God said it was happening. They see it. They can understand what your heart is. All those other people are Muslims, but Russia's not. And they said, you're using this situation to take over the Middle East and take over control. Now, you understand this. Russia's had nothing to do with Israel in all its history in times past, right? But today it has a military uh, uh, base for ships, for warships in the Alawite district of Syria. And it now has an air base in Syria, just above the Israeli uh, border, to fight ISIS. It's coming. It's a coming. But we can use this to evangelize people, providing you don't put any times to it. You learn prophecy and you use it as a tool. Because if you go up to an atheist, you've got to understand how they think, or an agnostic, they think you, we're nuts. They call us God botherers. You go up and say to a person who has talked himself into believing there is no God and he puts friends around him and they all talk about it and criticise the Bible. If he was God was good, why do little children die and all these sort of things, the theological nonsense that comes out of their mouth, right? Okay? And you go up and say, you need a friend in Jesus. <laughs> now, there are people who need a friend in Jesus, but they don't. They don't see it. But you can undermine it. You can undermine their whole foundation by showing them prophecy. And this is just one. There's far more simpler ones that are jaw-dropping. Right? This is just one example. And you can show it to them and then you present the gospel because the stronghold is broken. Full stop. Jesus said they will not believe that one rose from the dead. You get these people who are, ah, oh, but the Spirit of God's gigantic on me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus told us he's not wrong, right? They will not believe it. He's giving you an understanding, an insight into the way they think and both prophecy and uh, creation undermines what is being said. Now, the next one is the kings of the east. Now, I haven't got these verses for you um, because you should know them. They're pretty common. In Revelation, we're told that the kings, plural, of the east. Right now, China is getting country after country. Don't worry, it's hand. It wasn't just the Solomon Islands or wherever it was, wanted to go into. They got their hands in Cambodia. They got their hands in even 
uh, involved. You should see Indian News, Gravitas, and watch how they're involved in undermining Sri Lanka's position, why it's collapsed, right? And the kings of the east, and then they were told the army is 200 million. I remember I became a Christian at this time in 1981, and, they, and China bragged it could defend itself with 200 million cavalry, right? And all Christians went, what? And they're called the kings of the east. Now, final thing. Final thing. This is the last three. And this is the beginning of the millennium. Beginning of the millennium. Let's go to Isaiah 49 and see what happens in the beginning of the millennium. Isaiah 49 verse, we'll go to verse 8 first to get the time frame, okay? And it says here, Isaiah 48, and it says here, we'll go to verse 8. Surely, hang on, I've got not Isaiah 48, 49. Sorry. Isaiah 49, uh, verse 8, we'll start. In the acceptable time, thus says the Lord, in the acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you, I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. To restore the earth, <coughs> to cause them to inherit the desolate heritage, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun nor uh, uh, sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely they shall come from afar. Look, those from the north, from the west, and from the land of Sinem. The east right, Sinem. Sin was the ancestor of the Chinese people. They accept that. We even called the war between Japan and China in the 20th century the Japanese-Sino War, or Sino-Japanese War, okay? And it's plural, because they're gathering other groups to it. And then it says they come from the West. That's Europe. Go to Israel, Europe is the West. And then it says they come from the North. They're all, the survivors are all united now, coming up to Jerusalem to worship the king. Okay? What other evidence? The only people, a new belief system has come out, and this is my final point, where they make out the Antichrist comes from Islam. Right, that's a cock and bull story. And they'll say, do not be fearful of the Assyrian. Well, in context, they're talking about the Assyrian kingdom, 700 years, 700 and something years before Jesus was born, because they rule the world. But prophecy repeats itself, no doubt about it. And the king of Assyria is a type of the Antichrist. So was the king of Babylon. So was the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Right? None of them were Muslim. Right? <clears throat> and then the king of Tyre was a picture of, the, of Satan himself. Right? You were in the Garden of Eden. Right? It starts off on the king. He's a picture of Satan. The pride in him was the same as Satan. Okay? So, so what we have is... They're the three kingdoms, kingdom against kingdom, and now they're united. When it says the Antichrist, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. The sea is always a, a metaphor for the Gentile nations. We are told in Revelation 17, 15, that the waters are the peoples, the tongues, and the nations. And the beast that the uh, harlot that sits on the beast there was a city who, when Paul, uh, when, sorry, 
when um, John wrote it, uh, in 95 AD, he said, who rules the kings of the earth? That's who it was, it was Rome. And they sat, and it says it sits on seven hills, that city. We're talking Rome, we're not talking Muslims. They argue, you get people and they say, ah oh, yes, when it was the Roman Empire, because it's the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, that the Antichrist arises from, they go, yeah, but some of the troops, some of the armies of, of Caesar were in Turkey, were in these Arab countries. No, it's who rules it. You know, some, some of our troops were in Papua New Guinea, some were in uh, the Philippines, right? But Australia's here, right? It's not the Philippines, it's not there. But be careful of that, because, I'll just finish this line. He is going to look like the, the Messiah, the Antichrist, because he's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. And we know that Jesus destroys the enemies of Israel in the Armageddon scenario, but physically, he was using the Antichrist to do it. When God armies went to war against Israel, some of the methods God used repeatedly was to get the enemies to fight each other. And that's what happens. And that comparison is gigantic if you see it. Jesus is coming back to sit in the temple, the Messianic temple, not the temple they're about to build, the, the real one in Ezekiel 40 to 49. 48. And so they, um, he's coming back for that. There are a lot of similarities. He's in place of Christ. It's a deception. So you, it's good to understand it because the whole world worships him. And professing Christians will acknowledge him because they'll make out the Muslims or Russia or the East to be the bad guy, right? To be the bad guy. And he's the good guy. He's on our side. Just close some prayer.